Welcome back to the Raven Magic Podcast. This podcast is a safe, sacred container for us to integrate the shadow together, giving it life, allowing it to be seen and heard, Join me, Raven Allison, as I interview a wide variety of guests dedicated to helping you explore the shadow safely. I invite you to set a sacred ritual space. Allow the medicine of the ravens into your experience. Grab your book of shadows and a pen and trust that you're not alone facing the depths of the collective shadow and how it interweaves into your own unique story. I hope you enjoy this episode and that it brings more consciousness into your life. Welcome back to the Raven Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Raven Allison, and I've actually got a lot of guests and episodes kind of geared up heading into the autumn season. I know we're not quite there yet, but it's really feeling like that where I am at. And I also just kind of made a promise to myself because I've been really inward and especially with Venus, I was really following that planet through the underworld and everything for those that follow astrology. Um, But I made a promise to myself that I was going to start doing kind of what I call my solo flies through the shadow and do smaller, shorter episodes. And one of the things that I really feel is present in my own reality and that I really want to share with other people is about like mental wellness in regards to shadow work and also kind of my own journey dealing with um, the mental health label which I've kind of transformed into a sacred viewpoint of my own self of bipolar so for those that don't know anything about me um, in 2020 I had a kundalini awakening And I was working with a shamanic healer, um, one of three that I've trained under. Um, And I'm actually going to have Jack, my, this is a different one, but my original mentor, he's coming on for an episode. We're going to talk about the gray path, which kind of ties into this quite nicely. So I'm really excited about that. Um, We're going to be recording together um, on September 7th. So I'll have that out, but um, a different mentor and healer um they were raising my kundalini so for those that don't know um we have a chakra energy system that goes from the root you know in our like kind of groin area um all the way up to the crown of our head and you know if you look at the caduceus symbol you'll see kind of like this rod or you know this there's kind of this conduit of energy that flows up the body and raising that energy is called the kundalini awakening and the idea is is that you're taking it beyond the animal form right of our root chakra primal survival life force into the creation feminine flow passion of the sacral and then up into you know your power um the solar plexus the masculine principle and then through the heart where then we get unconditional love um, compassion, you know, um, soul alignment is kind of the center point of this system. We go up into the throat where we have our will, our ability to listen and voice and communicate. We have then the third eye where we have our ability to imagine, dream, and receive oracle guidance. And we move into the crown where that's our divinity. It's our connection to source. It's all that's flowing through us. And, you know, sorry, I'm just making a tea here, if you can hear that in the background. But anyway, um, it's, it's just when I was working with them, I was slowly like I used to work with clients when I was a shamanic practitioner. Now I don't work 
hands on like that. I prefer psycho shamanism, which is helping people integrate like through a shamanic practice that combines the deep faucets of the psyche and archetypal structures with traditional shamanism in using embodied ritual magic as a bridge. And so that helps people learn their own bodies. Cause otherwise I found that if you have a healer kind of working on you, not that that isn't effective, but it really just kind of separates the mind body, especially in neurodivergent people where they are kind of just a mind and they're not in the body. And so then the soul or the mind will like intellectualize the learning or the healing or the past life fragment or whatever it is, but it doesn't get integrated into the body. And so the energy is kind of left behind. So when I had my Kundalini awakening, that surge of energy through my system triggered an intense state of psychosis. I was completely not, I wasn't able to care for myself. It was not in cognitive function. And I was in a state of mania for like a long time. It took, that was trying to get my dates right. 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th. So seven days, that's all you really need for the diagnosis. You need to be. So for those that don't know, the difference between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 diagnosis is that bipolar 1, you need over a week period long, which I'm just telling you I had before I was hospitalized of a state of mania, which is where you are literally not behind your own steering wheel of your of your own self. And you can't care for yourself and you're not in cognitive function and things like that. So um, otherwise, it's just a cyclical kind of disorder of energy um, that the illness is categorized by um, intense highs and lows. So hypomania of elated moods, fast talking, goal oriented behavior, you know, doing reckless behavior, um, and then periods of collapse and depressive um, moods where it's very despair. You have shame and judgment over maybe your actions that you did when you were manic and then potential suicidal thoughts and other things. Now I'm not a mental health expert and I haven't really researched. Well, I guess I've researched a lot about bipolar, but not in, not in the way that like, I guess a, like a traditional person would, it's been more of a, of a view of trying to learn more about it and see it in me and kind of witness it as an observer. So I just like wanted to let everybody know that that experience did happen to me. I was trying to like kind of put it behind me, but then it's funny how things kind of circulate around and you're like, okay, you know what? This needs to be talked about. This needs to be normalized. We need to have more of a conversation. This happens to a lot of us. So another episode that I will be doing that is coming up when it feels good in the line is I'm going to be having an individual that is also diagnosed with bipolar. They have bipolar two. I have bipolar one. So that'll be a, a deep dive episode where we can kind of talk about how it manifests differently according to the diagnostic criteria, which for those that are kind of interested, I only just found this out recently. It was actually Swiss psychiatrists like our, you know, our, our main man, Mr. Carl Jung, who originally differentiated um, that di- diagnosis between one and two, where one had to have a psychotic episode. And it had to last longer than seven days. It has to be a longer than that. I don't know why, but that is kind of there. And anyway, so I'm going to be having a friend that also has bipolar on the Raven Magic podcast. And the reason for that is because we actually met during this experience in the Ottawa hospital in Canada um, in the psych ward. And so we thought it would be a healing for us both to kind of share this openly. It's, it's, I will not lie. It is so hard for me to a even do this episode right now and be so hard for me to be able like to do these kind of discussions because 
of my own shadow (laughs) that wants to be the professional smart person that's helping you, right? I won't lie. That's very present for me right now that I'm observing. There's a lot of like, oh no, if I talk about this, like how is that going to be perceived? People aren't going to take me seriously and this and that. But I've had to just kind of breathe and, you know, just be okay with it. I think it's important. I feel like this is important and I feel like I'm not going to get into it now, but I just wanted to say for those that want to know about, you know, what it's like for people experiencing being hospitalized. Um, and it's, it's going to be a really cool episode because we have different perspectives. Like as an example, um, he, um, volunteer like he he self checked in to the hospital whereas i was like you know not, not able to do that so there's just different it, it, it's kind of going to be interesting and i think it'll be fun and relatable for those of you that might be listening that maybe do have your own um, mental health labels and everybody has their own mental health journey regardless of what that is And also for those that maybe have been hospitalized and for potentially um, clinical professionals that maybe want, um, you know, they probably hear, I I imagine as clinical professionals, you probably hear a lot from your clients, but I think sometimes it's interesting to hear it from a different perspective of just an experience, right? Where you're not playing the role of therapist. So you can take that hat off for these episodes and just really kind of receive it. So I just want to take a deep breath. Everybody can take one with me. Ah, Let it go. I'm going to take a sip of my tea. Thank you. And yeah, I just, I really just wanted to talk about bipolar and how I experience it in regards to shadow work and in regards to kind of Jungian psychology and how um, this archetypal work, this embodied dream work, why I even had, you know, Dr. Leslie Ellis and other people like Tony Ann on the Raven Magic podcast is because I really do feel like bridging those worlds is important. Now, I can't speak to other, um, you know, neurodivergence and stuff, though I do have students that have a wide range of mental um, labeling and neurodivergence, which my methods are effective for. But I can really only speak to my own experience in this. And it's coming from an experiential point of view, not a medical point of view. And I'm actually going to try and set my shadow worker hat off to the best of my ability and just speak to what is. Okay. So, you know, without knowing too much about Jungian psychology or shadow work, we can kind of just look at what we've already looked at, where the ego and the shadow are these two opposing forces, right? Anything that I identify as and then have an external judgment against outside of me is probably creating a denser, rejected aspect in my shadow. And so this polarization and dissonance between ourselves as a whole creates splitting. And I really feel that heavily as somebody that is observing, um, you know, how bipolar manifests within me is that there has been a lot of splitting of the archetypes now for those that don't know what archetypes are, they're characters, symbols, motifs that are happening within us, um, whether we're aware of it or not. And all an archetype wants is to reach wholeness in its expression. And all archetypes are bipolar. Cool, eh? So if we look at bipolar from a Jungian view, People with bipolar tend to alternate in the archetypal structures between extremes, ranging from one side to the other. 
Now, the reason for that, now I'm again, not a medical professional people and not even seeing. So I'm just, I'm just speaking from experience of integrating a lot of archetypal structures that had real big wedges and splittings inside me and finding my place on the spectrum in the gray, finding my place. Where does it feel aligned? Where do I feel stable? Where can I do this? Now, not everybody is going to be able to do this, but this is why these methods are effective. Um, but I just kind of wanted to say that for most people, that's actually what's happening in, in the bipolarization and how this comes to occur is a wide variety of different reasons, right? Because it, it can be like childhood trauma. It can be anything. Um, people with bipolar apparently have completely different brain structures. I, as somebody that also documented their addiction to Mar Mary Jane, I call it, um, marijuana, I also noticed that that exasperated the symptoms of bipolar and vice versa. I found when I, and I'll, I can even link these in the description. There's a great, um, video. I, I think his name's like Dr. Hubbard. I, I could be pronouncing it wrong, but anyway, he did a great video on cannabis and its effects of the brains used before the brain's development at age 26 and how like if you use it prior to that i know there's lots of you out there they're like fuck raven what are you doing to me right now <laughs> i'm about to explode your brain um yeah there's been lots of studies that like up to 80 percent increase if you're using regularly cannabis before age 26 that literally changes the structure of the brain and then 80 percent of those people that had structural changes to the gray matter in the brain will will have a psychotic schizophrenic or bipolar like you know episode or something in their adult life as a result of that that um kind of decision so it just kind of really makes you rethink and i actually do see the splitting and the bipolar tendencies in non-bipolar students that i've had that use Mary Jane. And so it's just interesting to note because the reason I call it Mary Jane and maybe just take it or leave it if this resonates is because it helps me isolate the anima. So the collective soul, the collective feminine body in Carl Jung's model of the collective unconscious, it, it really helps me manifest it as two. It's a split. Mary and Jane, we've got two women. <laughs> the mother womb of the soul is literally in two. And so that just helps me as a viewpoint. Like if I were to choose to smoke that, for an example, I know 100% it's going to split my archetypal anima. Okay, so take it or leave it. That's how I have documented it within myself and other people listening might call bullshit on that. And I'll leave the, you know, a community post open. So if people want to add comments, um, but yeah, I'm just kind of more offering that not as fact. I'm offering it as um, a viewpoint. Like if you kind of wanted to look at that in yourself. Um, for me, it really does create the splitting. And so then we're getting we're getting kind of more of that high and the low and we're not really present in our body. Okay, let's breathe. So anyway, I just, if we're looking at bipolar in this Jungian view and we know that all archetypes are bipolar and that they want to reach wholeness, what this kind of has done for me on my path um, since leaving the psych ward in 2020, which was a 72 hour hold. And then I kind of just, intuitively so this is how i got on this path as a shadow worker like why i took certifications in dream um therapy and why i'm still like wanting to do different things in regards to uh you know more certification in shadow work and why i try to understand Jungian psychology and all these things is because intuitively even though i had an intense shamanic background which is quite similar to be honest depth psychology and shamanism are really one in the same they're two sides to the same coin and a lot of people call carl Jung like the western shaman because he essentially gave white words to shamanism um, and he kind of made it more accessible though completely fringe 
in it's still very fringe in psychology like right like it like a, it's it's real niched and Jungians have their own shadows which i also have another neurobiologist psychologist friend and a dream author that i will have on that we will like i just we don't know 100% what we're going to talk about but i i would love for him and i to talk about the shadows of carl jung himself and like just some you know where Jungians really do kind of miss out um on integration itself sometimes but that's a whole other topic I just, I think I just really needed to like publicly express what I'm dealing with. And so I appreciate everybody holding space. I'm going to try and keep this episode short, but I did just want to say that I intuitively tapped into a lot of these methods intuitively because I would get inside. It was for me, I, when I had the manic break, it was because I was then hyper aware that I had entangled myself in my mind. I, I wasn't present in my body. I was not present in reality. I was escaping reality my whole life and didn't really know. Um, even the psychiatrist that diagnosed me, I was like, no, like this has never happened. This is just one episode, like blah, blah, blah. But he, he, you know, he called out that like, you know, this is in your family line. Like they use your genetics. They use a wide variety of things. But he also said that because of my corporate background and my high functioning, that it, I probably would have never noticed it as mania and collapses. I would have noticed it as like stress from work and then high periods of goal oriented success. And, you know, looking back, I, for those that have followed me for a really long time, when I was doing all this crazy nature dance and all this movement, I'm literally disabled right now as a result of that. So to kind of say like, no, that wasn't mania is like, it's hard to not agree. Because if I look back, I'm like, wow, even before the Kundalini awakening, I was really doing some reckless behavior that was hurting my body. And I wasn't stopping. And so when I saw that I was kind of entangled in this imagination mind hell, um, I intuitively tapped into Jungian's methods without ever reading his stuff. And this is like what attracted a lot of psychologists and dreamers and things like that is because when they were witnessing it, they were just looking at it like, all right, this this woman's just expressing the shadow. She's just doing this. But I didn't even know what the shadow was. I didn't even know like any of this. <laughs> so it was really interesting to just kind of tap in and then have these integrative methods flow through me. But it was it was actually me at a soul level trying to get my soul and my body, my life force in my body and intuitively following my feminine flow right so it was it was very intuitive um and and i felt like i was inside a, a dream and so i was kind of like basically just walking the dream in reality and i would embody different parts and different characters and different archetypes and and i'd feel them and you know some of them would be maladaptive and i probably could have avoided you know hanging out in them too long but some of them were really ingrained in me as pleasure points as maladaptive complexes that that i derived pleasure from in my own internalized masochism and there's really no shame in that a lot of us love pain it's very pleasurable but if you're unconscious to why and if you're kind of unconsciously, you know, really liking something that is maladaptive to your energy and kind of feeding off of your own self, it, 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 it can have quite a seductive hook in you. And it took me a really long time to ground a lot of them and ensure that I could catch them and, you know, just kind of integrate them, love them, accept them. But I think catching their hijacking of my soul came first because a lot of them I couldn't stop. It was, and, and we all can relate to this. It's just that we're probably not aware, which leads me to my next attribute of those that have bipolar. Everybody has an observer position of their own self, their higher self. You can neutrally observe yourself. Now, what tends to happen in people with bipolar is that they are observing the self 
Um, and I think it's just riddled with judgment, hence the splitting, right? Because that's how a shadow and like the ego, like that's how that dissonance really gets in there. And it creates a big wedge is that your observer viewpoint is judging. And so God, this is why, like, I really felt like a Jungian view would sometimes manifest quite maladaptively for me because I would become the my own psychoanalyst to myself in the splittings and it was just like holy fuck this is not healthy <laughs> this is not healthy so that's when i developed the myrrh essence which um i did word at a different level of awareness for those that are kind of walking more of like a fairy path and more in the other world but now um if you want me to articulate it as best as i can at a at a i don't want to say lower level of consciousness at a mass like to the masses um essentially we use the mermaid because it's an it was one of in my experience it was the most ancient universal archetypal structure that affected both genders that i found in my body and it be, it provided such a vehicle between creature like the animal soul which i've already talked about in the lower chakras and the higher soul right of this kind of an otherworldly being and then we have the vehicle of water um, which is often used in dream work as a metaphor for our subconscious like the sea waters and so um yeah that's just kind of where it came from and i find it very effective because then we're just embodying the attributes of the of the mermaid but in a way that allows us to explore the shadow safely in embodied dream work which is just kind of like a waking experience that provides a somatic layer to traditional shamanic journeying and you can actually use them. I do use them in conjunction. So as an example, if I have something that I'm trying to discover about myself or a problem or something's come up, um, and I'm also a witch, so I might use the moon or other themes that are present collectively and flow with that, especially if it aligns with what I'm working on personally. And maybe I want to find out well, let's even talk about like the mermaid. So maybe I'm feeling that in me and, you know, maybe you're listening to this and you're like, you know what, I, I'm resonating with what Raymond's saying. Like, you know, the mermaid does really impact like both genders. It does like, yeah, that does feel like a vehicle of the shadow of the subconscious. I want to explore that within myself and you don't really know how to start. Well, I might start by getting a drum track. So there's tons online. Calm, Calm Whale is one that I use. I also, if you go to my YouTube, I have a playlist titled uh, Journey. I think it's Journey Drum Tracks or something. So you can always pop in there and pick one. Um, or you can get somebody to drum for you or drum for yourself. But basically what I do is I set a timer for 20 minutes. I set an intention. So hopefully you have a guide or a power animal or somebody that can go with you. If you don't, make that your first journey. I want a guide, I'd preferably an animal guide and, you know, just kind of open, don't get attached and receive what animal comes or you can journey with me and I would be happy to fetch you your power animal because <laughs> that's something that I'm really good at. Um, but yeah, uh, basically you can just set an intention, put a timer on, light a candle if you want and put the drum track on. And you can relax, get yourself in a relaxed state and you go. So for those that have never journeyed before, you might, um, maybe I'll do an episode on that and you can go into more details, but you, there's probably nowadays, there's probably so much information if you Google it. Um, but essentially you just throw on the drum track, get yourself into the, that theta state. You set one intention. So it's crystal clear. You go with your power animal if you can, or the guide that's coming through to help support this. Sometimes this could be a deity. Sometimes this could be a passed on loved one. Sometimes this could be an animal guide or otherwise, um, or otherworldly guide. And you set the intention. So in this case, we're setting the intention to explore the mermaid or the mer being within us. So, hey, Raven suggested this. I want to see how this is manifested inside of me. Or you can even forego the shamanic journey and incubate a sleeping dream if that's more your style. 
um, both will yield kind of the same result, but you can incubate that, set the intention, put the track on with the timer and go. And you allow the dream to descend, you allow the visions to go through and you just kind of receive it. You can have a journal and your book of shadows beside you. And then when the alarm goes off, you're going to stop the journey, make sure you're like back. Um, so if you're not, if you're still like way out, just kind of take moments to ground into the body. When the alarm goes off, breathe back into the body, make sure that you're present in reality and you can have a glass of water or even some food that helps ground after. And then you're going to write everything down and trust that you'll remember what you need to remember. Then where the myrrh essence is different is that's the embodied layer. So let's say now we find out that, wow, I didn't know that the mermaid was like really impacting me. And I saw scenes from like my childhood where I was swimming. And then I saw, um, you know, maybe even some negative memories. Sometimes that can come up. Like I'm just using this as, as one-off examples. It, it, it might not apply to you, but you know, it could be that maybe that was interacting with you and then you see behaviors of how you've acted within that part. It could be that you just went on an otherworldly journey. You see a bunch of other mer beings and aquatic life and you were swimming around. Like it could be anything really. So you're going to take what you were given. You're going to intuitively in the heart, pull out the heart thread. So what does that mean? That means you're just going to not think too much. You're going to feel and you're going to take what felt resonant inside your body in a positive way inside your heart. And you can then get more curious. So if you want to craft a myrrh essence thread, that's something that I teach. Like at, I have a course available at Avalon Academy. If you want to learn the actual layers and the structures of how I break it down and do your own rituals, I also do these one-on-one -on -one with a lot of my students because it's so effective. But you can try and do this by yourself. The difference is, is that like everybody can do this by themselves. But the difference is, is that I've spent a lot of time in the layers of the energies and, you know, formulating a meditation that helps people really tap into this full spectrum, which I like literally feel is bipolar. So it's kind of interesting to kind of look at it that way, too, where it's like, wow. This really helps people bridge the polarities of their own archetypes, regardless of how they manifest. So there you go. Um, but essentially what you can do is you can then set a sacred waking ritual. And what I do is you could put a drum track on again and then watch how the body is speaking this intention through or the part or, you know, get embodied in it or see how it feels and get more curious. You're kind of like essentially embodying now the dream character, which we talked about in the episode with Dr. Leslie Ellis. But what I do and what makes the myrrh essence different is I took a maladaptive way that I was escaping reality, which was music and imagining and dancing. And I turned it around shamanically. So what do I mean by that? I mean that now what I do with a lot of my students and myself uh, is I craft a journey thread with music. Cool, eh? So instead of using a drum track, I actually trigger the emotional states that I want to stir up. So let's say in this case, we did a journey. Okay. The mermaid, I see it's like in my childhood. I see it's affected my feminine sexuality and expression. Now I'm luring everybody like a siren. I'm sure we can relate to that. That's another universal archetype attached to the lover. So, okay. Now I see all these times where the mermaid was like sirening around and doing things that she really didn't want to do to get a man to, you know, get people to like her, um, vindictive to her friends and other sisters, who knows, no judgment, but let's say this is something that surfaced. So now I want to kind of feel into it. Why would I want to do this? Number one, you want to purge out shame, guilt, and negative energy that you're holding in regards to this that's still inside the body, even though your mind can very much cry and the emotions can cry. Your mind can be like, oh, that's a behavior I don't want to do anymore. And it can process it. The body 
will still hold. Excuse me. So then what we do is we take music tracks. So usually I take a track that is dreamlike, right? Watery and whatever. And then I do the guided meditation to connect to the mer essence. And if you really want to know what that is, you're going to have to book time with me. You're going to have to come to one of the free drop-ins or you're going to have to go to Avalon Academy <laughs> because that's just the options that are available for it right now. And if I always tell people, it is much easier to experience it with me and then you'll feel it and you'll know and you'll be like, wow, that was effective than it is for me to put words to it because it is so dream archetypal in language that you can't necessarily fully pin it down. But we're going to try and just talk about it like entering into music. But please keep in mind that like this can have quite maladaptive impacts and entering into music requires deep self-awareness and the ability to be aware of what's happening in the body. Okay. We learn this in the subspace undercurrents in module five at Avalon Academy, but it is important to know about musical soundscapes and entering them because it can get real maladaptive quick and embodying dream characters that are maladaptive perpetrators, negative villainous. Um, it, you have to be really skilled at shamanism and body awareness in your somatic functioning. And that requires multidimensional functioning. And so I'm not saying you, you aren't that or minimizing your gifts. I'm just saying, Hey, tap yourself on the shoulder. This is serious shamanism, which is why I put psycho in front of the shaman because it is combining psychodrama and psychomagic with traditional shamanism, which like, it, it's, it's quite a developed skill. Everybody can learn it. That's what I do in my mentorships. I teach the art of living psychoshamanically. But like, if you, if you don't really know what you're doing, then it's going to appear just like dance, or you're going to take on these maladaptive archetypal structures and get a rush out of them without integrating them. Okay. So there's your caution. There's your disclosure, especially if you're bipolar or neurodivergent. This could like be quite a new addictive video game pass. <laughs> it's the video game of your own soul and it is addictive as fuck. So you got to get conscious. But anyway, all right, let's go. <laughs> I'm just laughing at myself. I'm like, hello, this is like Ravens. Like, but yeah, I, I am trying to kind of word my craft in a new way. And it is kind of like the video game of your soul. So it's fun. But in my group journeys, especially not so much one on one, because I can really craft a thread specific to what you're dealing with, and then guide you like shaman would. Um, and then you're going to be in charge of your own body. So I'm prompting you to feel the areas and then you'll get good at clearing your own energy and alchemizing it. But in the group journeys, I have had students and participants experience quote unquote bad trips because that is a group thread, right? So that's almost like me setting a scene as like a dungeon master and like putting everybody into the subspace of their own subconscious. And it's funny to look at it that way, but it's also very true because music, like I said, maladaptive real fucking fast. Why? Because pain is pleasurable and we love wallowing in our own pain. And if we can't identify that we're stuck wallowing in our own pain versus, versus integrating, then that's where it can really loop maladaptively. Okay. So let's move forward. So we're setting our ritual space. We got our mermaid part. We're like, all right, we got the siren. I kind of don't like this. Like, damn it. Was I using my power to like wield on this shin and competitive and you know what no judgment so i'm gonna put on some tracks so right away i put some tracks and do the mer meditation and i use a track that keeps the body in a dream like state i put waves on get the water going get your soul flowing and you're gonna want to trigger a trance state like you had with the drum so however you're achieving that why do we want to do this because now we're gonna to the best of our ability observe ourself as we're letting go of the control of the mind. So the mind's only job is to neutrally observe. That's it. 
And if you are bipolar, that's going to be really hard for you because you're going to have that inner Jungian so fast, even if you don't know who Carl Jung is, he's there in the bipolar split because he is the psychoanalyst judging your split. And I'm just like, take it or leave it. But I feel like that is true for a lot of people that I've talked to that have bipolar. They're like, wait, this really resonates. Why is that? I'm like, well, way out there in my genius self, bipolar <laughs> could be the myth of Carl Jung himself, but take it or leave it. According to Carl Jung, you better find out what myth you're unconsciously reenacting because it could be a tragedy. <laughs> and he was the first ever personal myth. And that grandiose sense of self and bipolar really wants to be their own story. So I'll just leave it there. Anyway, let's move forward. <laughs> See the distractibility? It's like, hello, we've taken like 15 minutes to get here. But um, yeah, so we're in our little circle. We're going to trigger these lucid states. And the mind's job now is to just observe. It's not to do anything. Now, if anything, it's to receive visions. But we're going to observe the body. And we're going to put the stream like music on. And we're going to watch the body. We can do like a seaweed dance. Really get underwater. Get this dream like embodied feel. And then the tracks that you're going to select are going to be music that you've selected as a thread. So what does that mean? That means that you're going to take songs that potentially stir up this siren energy. Okay, when when did I have this vindictive, like sexual, predative energy? I'm going to pick one of those and I'm going to see how this part, this archetype interacts with me and I'm going to see where I judge it. I'm going to see the discrepancies. Then you're going to pick another song that empowers that and dreams it forward. What does that mean? That means you're going to take, and this is like where it gets better if you're working with somebody like me, not to like push it, but I literally accept sliding scale one-on-one -on -one mentorships all the time, fully accessible, like fully. You would not believe the different amounts that people give me per month to work with me and I I think I've only said no twice. So you're going to select a song that then empowers that. So let's say you were wielding your sexuality against yourself, right? To try and get somebody to like you. You're going to take the next. So you have explored that. Now you have more data. Now you're going to dream it forward. You're going to take the next is going to be empowered in a healthier way, whatever that means to you. Then the, then the next song is going to build off of that. So the energy is essentially we're going diving. It's like we're warming up in the water. Then we're diving into the unconscious. We're getting data. And then we're going to alchemize the data into new energy. So we're going to then elevate the songs in positivity and more higher vibration. And then we're going to have a song where we release and come down back to the body. So a meditative song, a track that helps you push energy through. And it really is an art. And I can't believe that I kind of went into it like this. Like for those that are trying it, I would highly encourage you, like no pressure, no money needed or anything. Tell me that you did it. Come to me, share your experiences. I will give you feedback. Hmm. Yeah, I'll give you feedback. And the reason I'm saying this is because of everything I've articulated. Like I, this is why I put it in a course in Avalon Academy. And, you know, I almost want to like, I almost want to like open it up. Maybe I'll put it on my patron. I don't know, but I, I am really seeing the medicine in the mer essence. And every time I've tried to articulate it, not as that, um, and just do embodied journeying or whatever, it really is needed. Like it, what I've created in the layering is really important because it taps us into the how what I want to illustrate as the primordial womb of Earth, of the planet. And so it's really hard for me to articulate because it's almost like if you want to talk about a split in bipolar to kind of bring this whole full circle, that is the split, the core one that really drives me nuts <laughs> and drives me crazy is that I have this eccentric experiential, like, oh yes, the mermaid and this and that. And then I have this other side of me that is literally like facts, science, logic. I need to explain this psychologically. I need to have people understand me. And the manifestations are completely equal, which is why, and I won't go into this today, but this is why the Ravens as an internal pair, when I talked about in the Twin Flame series that I did, 
they help me so much. They literally, I say they saved my life because they, they were, yeah, they were my shamanic allies to bridge those two together. And yeah, so if you try this method and you want a myrrh essence meditation, that's something that I'm going to try and put out there. Something that I want to try and have that people can like download is a guided meditation by me so that you can tap in and actually feel it in your body. But I do, I have started hosting drop-ins again on my Insta live. So, you know, if you want to come out and dive in and experience it, I highly recommend it. And another thing that I don't know if I specified or not, I really want you to set a ritualistic space when you're doing this. It's not, oh, I'm going to throw some tracks together and let an archetype possess me because that is where it's dangerous. And I know that I keep kind of like, you know, my inner mother, my inner elder woman is like, come on, kiddos. But I'm not trying to like belittle you or think that you don't have these gifts. Like I don't want it to be received that way. This is because it's really deep work. And if you're perceiving it at a surface level of like, oh, we're just moving around like mindlessly, it's really not like that. And a lot of people, when I was giving this words for the first time, a lot of people were thanking me for giving words to their experience. A lot of writers, authors, other creative people were like, oh my gosh, thank you. I didn't even realize that I was projecting parts of myself into my story or that I was all these characters and these were all me. So, you know, the myrrh gives people that viewpoint of themselves and allows them to have an archetypal vehicle. So that's why I talked about the split and why bipolar is linked to the myrrh. It's because the myrrh essence literally closed the split for me. It really helped me because when you're living in your mind and you're analyzing and you're looking for the answer and you're like, okay, this is why this happened. And here's my childhood and here's this. And then you're also so experiential, your, you know, your mind is different than other people's and you can sense things and the words you use maybe are coming more from the left brain than the right. And you have like a dream speak and all these other things, then, you know, it really allows those worlds to collide because it's an energy that we can tap into that's running through the web of all life. We can feel that. In the sacral, you know, the connection to the web, to the, what I call the crystalline grid. A lot of people have thanked me for that visual, the crystalline grid roots just running through like water in the earth, you know, take that visual. And that's where the myrrh essence is really beautiful because if you receive it, like it's a meditation, then that's fine. But you can also receive it as like reality, bridging the other world into this world. And, you know, then we're extending to the stars and we're honing in on our own star and bringing that light in so that we're experiencing this vast spectrum of what people can intuitively feel, but might not have words or a vehicle to like explore within themselves. And then, you know, on the psychological side in the psyche, we have, oh, okay, this is me tapping into archetypes, to parts, to shadow work. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Deities, whoever you want to call in. And then on the energetic side, the shamanic side, it's like, oh, I can use this to explore intergenerational themes, Um, my energy body, where I'm holding things, where I need to move stuff out. And so you really do have to have a sacred ritual space because otherwise you risk possession. And, you know, a shaman would call it entity possession and a Jungian would call it archetypal possession, right? But in my opinion, they're the same thing experienced at different levels of how you're uniquely perceiving life. And I know a lot of you are not going to like this, but that's just like star seeds to me. People are perceiving it as I'm an alien from another planet and I'm in a human body. Totally. 
I'm okay with that. And, you know, a Jungian or a mythic embodied person is going to perceive that as, oh, cool. I wonder what narrative, what myth those people are grounding into reality. I'll word it that way so that it's healthier because I don't want to negate anybody's reality, but like, it's hard for me. And maybe this will help you understand me. Um, not that you need to understand me, but this might help you understand where I'm coming from in the, in the multitude of viewpoints that I hold simultaneously that I'm trying to actually integrate into myself. That's where I'm at on my quest is when you can see things as they are in different perspectives, then it gets hard to articulate to a specific audience. And that's where I've really personally struggled. And the myrrh essence is my way of letting that go and letting people experience it wherever they're at. And it's a real beautiful gift and ceremony. And when we bring things from a dream or from a shamanic you know, process or even from a therapy session, oh, I just had a therapy session I was talking about this. I found out like, you know, my mom did this to me and that, and as a result, I've been acting such and such a way. So instead of judging that part, get curious. Maybe there's songs that you're going to go escape into anyway. That's where I'm saying, hey, stop escaping and start living the gray mythic path. Like you can live myth here. You can bridge the other world into reality in a safe way that makes tangible sense and that helps earth and that helps other humans, right? Like this is kind of like, I think what a lot of us are here to do, quite frankly, everybody in their own unique way. It's like becoming, you know, walking that line where we honor the web of all life and other worlds as equal to this world, like our ancestors did. And so after you do your little journeys, so your dream incubation or your therapy incubation, the myrrh essence ritual, then you're going to close the space after you breathe out the energy. So I do have a rule for those that have joined and dived into the myrrh alongside me. If you picture a myrrh being, a mermaid, the tail Envision yourself with that tail right now, and I call it anything below the belt, lower three chakras, right? Solar plexus, sacral root, anything that feels uncomfortable there, that is because there's guilt, shame, or some kind of judgment, or some kind of I don't feel worthy to live here on the planet. And that energy has to go out. So you can picture like even keeping the waves on and taking moments with feathers, with clearing items, with crystals, whatever you're using in your sacred space, and you're going to clear that energy out. You're going to grant. It's very, very important because we're triggering our body into a heightened state that could very well trigger mania or other things, right? So we have to be cognizant of that and we have to be the caretaker of our own self. And then you're going to purge that out. If you have congestion, if you're receiving too many visions up high, that energy also has to go down and out, down and out. So you're giving this to earth. You're releasing it. Now, after these and you've closed the circle, you, I tell people to ground. So how do you ground? Eat something. Go sit with a tree. Get in the bath. Have a shower and cleanse. Um, you know, breathe, do, do something without music in silence, put the, put a drum track on again to get that heartbeat going, to get the primal beat of life going, right? Just do something. I say, do something muggle, (laughs) treat your human right now. And then, and then you're going to ground. And if you're feeling uncomfortable energy, just breathe. Breath is your friend. And it can guide. And sitting with a tree is definitely like my advice every time because they, they'll they just take and alchemize that energy for you. And they're really sturdy. You can put your back up against it. Oh, yeah. So anyway, I think I'm going to end here for today. But like, please reach out if you try to do this. Um, I know, well, I don't want to judge myself, but I know that I can kind of be flighty in the way that 
when I just allow myself to flow with words and teachings, then they just kind of come out of me. And there might not be a rhyme or a reason when I'm like, oh, I'm going to talk about bipolar and like this. So don't worry when I'm with guests and I'm more in this like interviewer hat or holding that space, I do a lot better. But as I said, I also kind of want to do shorter episodes regularly where I'm just checking in and sharing some of my skill sets because I really want more people to be able to do these things. And as much as I love having students and mentors and and I want to receive my abundance, I really am doing my best to get money flowing in circulation with the earth and receive it at the heart to heart connection, which always includes my own shadow. And that's why I offer sliding scale mentorships is because when there is a heart connection, I there's always an exchange that happens energetically And my shadow unconscious will integrate as well in those connections. And it's really beautiful. Oh, yeah. But I love teaching the art of psychoshamanism. I don't think that you have to have a psychology degree to do this. I think that the psycho needs to be there because, for one, I am not a traditional shaman. Uh, Number two, I the ritual magic aspect and more of the psychodrama aspect is there. And it, I think it just needs more people, A, knowing what it is, B, letting it be an art that unfolds naturally in their life. And, you know, we're all psycho. <laughs> we are all crazy. All of us, every single last one of us even the muggliest of muggles and the normiest of normies. And that's okay. And when we can learn to navigate life without trying to fight who we are, then that is really, really beautiful. And it's something that I'm still learning myself. Um, because it is really hard for me to kind of witness that I could be bipolar. And I say could be because I I want to leave this here. Diagnostic criteria for certain things, especially in our culture now where a lot of young people are self-diagnosing, it is kind of a double-edged sword because it can help us when we know what's quote-unquote wrong or what's happening But just like any archetype, any myth, any fairy tale, any story, when we're looking at things as a, like, you know, take astrology, you know, what start, you know, what sign are you? What sun sign are you? (laughs) Oh, I'm this, right? A mental health label is no different. If you continue to look at it, then you're going to see it in yourself. It has resonance. It has collective weight. And so I feel that for me, I really do want to, you know, be the psycho shaman where I'm open to being bipolar. I can see it in me. But at the same time, what kind of freaking you know, what kind of magician, shaman, witch would I be if I just said, oh, that's it. That's me. I'm going to identify with this and whatever. And to be honest, the more that I did that when I was really deep diving into it, the more I became it. And I watched that consciously. And so I think that, you know, it, it is advisable to, yes, accept what's real for you. It's nice when I can talk to other bipolar people and they understand me. It's like, okay, cool. Like we all have these kind of similar aspects. But at the same time, autism gets misdiagnosed as bipolar. It's one of the most common misdiagnoses there are. Um, You know, there are other outside aspects. I was using psilocybin, I had a Kundalini awakening. Like those things can trigger psychosis and mania as well, right? Like we have to kind of be, or at least I have to be and choose to be, more open-minded and more open-hearted and you know i i 
moved autoimmune, like I got them to revoke an autoimmune diagnosis, which is more physical because of me continuously to purge it out because it felt like it was intergenerational and it wasn't mine to hold in my body. So, you know, if somebody's like, oh, bipolar, it's incurable, it's a progressive disease, you know, do you want to believe that? Not deny it, but you know what I mean? Like our mind is powerful. We are powerful. And when you learn to humbly tap into that, as opposed to in the narcissist grandiose self, then I don't know, like I'm open to alchemizing bipolar and sharing that wisdom with others. And for me, because I experienced it as a, as a three year come down (laughs) into my body, it was all archetypes. It was all archetypes and trauma. And that is all it was. And I really, really reflect that truth to you. We don't have to live in these stories, just like we don't have to live in a myth that we're unconsciously reenacting. Some of us will not have mental control and that's okay too. I'm not saying it's for everybody, but I am kind of reflecting an option here to, you know, don't trap yourself in a disorder, dis-ease, a disharmony. Just love yourself in it. And that's where the path is going to open. And you're going to be more heart open to how you can learn to get your mental illness into a position of your mental power. And especially those, like if anybody's listening with bipolar, please just come and introduce yourself to me. I would love to hear your story and I would love to reflect some options. I mean, my options are not going to work for everybody because everybody learns differently. And, but you know, if there's one gift that I would love everybody listening to give themselves today, it would be an animal ally in the other world that can help you navigate this world because we are never alone And the animals are like the biggest bridge you can have because they're riddled in story, which connects to the unconscious and the mind. And they have a physical manifestation in their pure primal innocence on earth. And so I really reflect that truth to you. And if you want more information on that, I did. um, I was a guest on Tony Ann's podcast, uh, soul whispers so you can go over there and we talk about how to work psychoshamanically with your animals and they will just help you and guide you on the way so thanks so much for listening i'm gonna continue to open up about mental health and everything and i'm i do have some other things coming up but it's just a really important topic so i encourage people to share uh, reach out to me comment on the podcast or whatever but yeah Like we're in this together and I'm not asking you to negate your mental health label. I think what I'm trying to do is give you permission to open to it being a positive thing in your life, not a negative and it being a skill and an attribute and it being part of your unique self and how it streams into a collective experience of those sharing that label with you. (sighs) Anyway, thank you so much for listening to me today, holding space for me and, you know, allowing me to speak about bipolar because I do have a lot of shame um, because of the stigma of it. So thanks everybody. And I will see you all next episode. Cheers. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Raven Magic Podcast. If you would like to support me, Raven Allison, and this podcast, please consider donating to the PayPal link provided in the description of each episode. All proceeds are fed back into this project dedicated to helping make conscious shadow integration more widely accessible. 
Another way that you can give back to this project and yourself is if you're somebody that needs help, that doesn't have anywhere to explore these darker aspects, these unconscious aspects of the self, I have a patron community dedicated to empowering you psychoshamanically with prompts, playbacks, lectures, and classes, as well as community of people just like yourself. It's open pledge and fully accessible, starting as low as a dollar per month. I hope to see you there, and thank you for exploring your unconscious self.